son of a bitch. Hello again. Um, things have been going really well around here. I had a very successful booth at the Reptilian Nation Expo uh, in August. Made a lot of connections, made a lot of sales. Definitely made back my investment on preparing for that booth. Uh, my beetles were stronger than ever, powering through several skulls a week. I was able to dedicate a lot more time to the necro parlor uh, without a job, for better or worse. And uh, yeah, things are going good. Until last week. Let me show you what I found. Son of a bitch. Things are going great. Um, I was in the middle of filming a, a really long time lapse for you guys, and when I received an order of beetles placed on my website, I'd had enough beetles that I was listing them on the website again for sale. And I went to collect them, and I found a horrible infestation. Of course, I'm talking about the buffalo beetle, which is a type of lesser mealworm. Let me pick out some of these intruders for you. I'm not being too careful as I pluck them out because I'm going to eradicate them all eventually. My handy camera does not actually focus or do well with zoomed in shots, so here are a bunch of macro photographs. Can you tell the difference between the hard-working domestic beetle and the dangerous intruder? Let's take a closer look. Here we have the fuzzy caterpillar-like dermestid, and here we have the shiny mealworm buffalo beetle. The adult dermestid has almost a wood grain texture going down the elytra, and the scarabidae antenna end in a club-like shape. The buffalo beetle is much shinier, and the antenna have a much more tapered structure. Also, the adult specimen of Dermestis maculatus has white speckles on the underside of the thorax and the abdomen, while the buffalo beetle maintains its shiny blackness. Here's a shot of three different domestic beetle larva instars and three different intruder larva instars. Here's most of the domestic life cycle, missing the eggs and pupa stage. And here's the buffalo life cycle, including some pupa. Other than fuzziness versus shininess, the larva can be differentiated by their head and mandible size. You can see I also caught this larva in the middle of molting. The easiest difference to tell the two larvae apart is the thickness and the stripes. The domestid is wider for its length and has one large stripe going vertically down the body. The mealworm is more slender and has many more horizontal stripes spanning the length of the body. Here's a comparison between the two adults. You can see the difference in antenna, abdomen color, and a slight size difference. So I collected a handful of domestids from my molting chambers which you've seen in previous videos, but I'm going to set a trap to catch the majority of the rest. I need to separate out as many as I can to start a fresh, intruder-free colony. Okay, you say to yourself, we know how to tell the difference between the two. Well, what does it matter? Why is it so detrimental? Buffalo beetles are dangerous for domestic beetle colonies. Not only are they a direct competitor for food, water, and space, but they also prey on domestic larvae reducing their numbers over time. Why not just have a colony of buffalo beetles then, you might ask? Well, for one, they have more dietary requirements, and a beetle keeper doesn't necessarily want to feed their beetles vegetables, grains, and other sources of potential mold and pests. Also, buffalo beetle larvae will chew bone, destroying many of the finer specimens that domestic beetles would leave pristine and intact. I've shown this process before, but I never miss an opportunity to make a time lapse. I set the trap, pull some bait out of my freezer full of dead things. And let them do their thing. 
While the trap is set, let's take a closer look at these beetles. Excuse my messy workbench. I always have a lot of projects happening at the same time. I lose more glassware that way. Oh well, that's a problem for future flocking. This is actually when I took all those comparative pictures I already showed you, but first I had to humanely euthanize them. You may not think it is humane by the state of their wriggling, but this is how entomologists and other scientists study arthropods and is accepted as the standard. After I had taken my comparative pictures, I collected them all into a little vial. Nothing goes to waste in the necroparlor. Maybe I'll sell this vial on my website to raise funds for a new beetle colony. Alright, let's check in on the beetle trap. It's been going about 24 hours at this point. I collected all the beetles in the trap and set them aside for now, then reset the trap. This was the moment I made my first big mistake. I set this beetle trap several times, getting fewer and fewer beetles each time. So the first day I collected had the majority of the beetles. After I collected them, I set them aside on the counter until I could sort through them later. However, the next day, they must have caught 10 or 15 minutes of morning sun through my kitchen blinds. The direct sunlight in their enclosed container heated them up and they all died. I've kept beetles in containers like that many times with no incident, but this was a tragic accident and it hit particularly hard because these are all the beetles I have left and every individual is priceless to me. This was the trap after the second day. Significantly fewer beetles, but now it's all I got. Then I began sorting them. I handpicked every single beetle and larva. Dermestids got sorted to the safety of the paper towel on the left, buffalo beetles to the euthanasia chamber to the right. In the middle of this process, I had to pack up everything and bring it to the Wasatch Reptile Expo. I sold a lot of my wet specimens, skulls, bones, insects, and other dead art. I got to meet a lot of new people, while my partner in crime, Maddie, made all of my sales. The highlight of the weekend was when I met a young fan who recognized me from YouTube. He and his bearded dragon were so excited to see a real-life YouTuber and wanted a picture. Thanks so much for making my day, friend. If you saw me at the expo, then you might also have seen the jar I brought with me. It contained all the beetles I had left. I placed a skinned and gutted mouse in there to snack on, and these pictures are 48 and 72 hours after I placed it in there. I also fed them some cooked eggs and bacon grease to jumpstart their growth. These were all the larvae I caught on the last day of trapping. I got about all I was able to get at that point, so it was time to cook the rest. I did this by increasing the thermostat control of the beetles. I gradually increased the heat to lethal temperatures, cooking everything alive inside. I didn't want it to get too high though, or I might start melting the plastic inside or destroying my electrical equipment. 
After sitting overnight, I checked for any signs of life. All was quiet and still. Until I lifted up this bucket, there must have been a small insulated pocket under it because it was chock full of beetles. All of them buffalo. Really goes to show how bad the infestation was. So I removed the bucket, bumped up the temp a few more degrees, and left overnight until all were dead. After that, I scooped, vacuumed, and wiped the interior clean, getting rid of all evidence that beetles had once lived there. Then I placed my jar with a few remaining survivors back in there, quarantined inside the jar until I can verify the colony is a thousand percent clean. Okay, now onto that nagging question that's been in the back of your mind the whole time. Where did these beetles come from? How can I prevent them from getting into my colony? Well, it took some investigating, but I think I know exactly how it happened and where they came from. About a year or so ago, I ordered a starter kit for a dubia cockroach colony from a reputable feeder insect supplier. They were awesome. The kit came with a ton of food, water crystals, egg crate, feeder boats, everything you'd need to raise a successful colony. However, there were a few extra hitchhikers in the dubias themselves. Now, dermestid beetles are commonly found in cockroach and cricket colonies because they are great at cleaning up any insect corpses that would otherwise pollute the rest of the colony. So when I saw a couple of small, dark beetles, I didn't think too much of it. I kept them away from my dermestids to be safe, but otherwise leave them be. I even added a few dermestids from my colony to the roaches to help out. This dubia colony did great for months and months. Every once in a while I'd collect a pile of dead roaches or frass or molted skins and throw them away. Well, one day I had a pile a little larger than normal and I had a great idea. I would feed the dead roaches to my dermestids. After all, nothing goes to waste at the necroparlor, right? Well, that's all it took. I broke the golden rule of dermestid beetle husbandry. Freeze, or otherwise sterilize, every meal you put in with your beetles. If I had frozen the pile of dead roaches for a few days before putting it in there, I would never have had a problem. Instead, I dumped a few developing larvae straight into my colony. About a month later, I even saw a big larva. I freaked out, but I did some research and found out that it was just a type of mealworm, so I calmed down, figuring it must have just been munching on some cockroach food, but anything that was left certainly would starve out and die. It wasn't until I discovered how horrible my infestation was that I discovered that buffalo beetle larvae eat meat and vegetables, and I was harboring a growing population that was chipping away at my workers and slowing productivity. I cannot stress this enough. Sterilize everything you put in your colony. Some people feed their beetles high-protein dog food, which is a common source of mites and other pests. Just freeze a Ziploc bag full of dog food for a few days before you put it in there. Some professional taxidermists will put giant elk or moose heads in their beetle colony, which are too big to put in a freezer. Well, in that case, dunk the whole head in a big bucket of ammonia water overnight to kill and drown any other pests that might be left on the raw carcass. Having enough fine mesh on the ventilation holes of your beetles and always sterilizing whatever you introduce to your beetles will highly reduce the chances of you ever contracting a colony collapsing pest. Remember, it literally only takes one individual mite buffalo beetle, ham beetle, etc, etc, to get into your colony. One pest could reproduce and create an entire infestation. Many beetle keepers have multiple colonies isolated from each other for the very reason that if something happens to one, they won't lose everything, like I did. Well, time for a fresh start. 
I am lucky to have some friends in the community that helped me out a little bit by donating some small beetle colonies. Look forward to a simple how to make a beetle enclosure video in the near future. Oh, and also, I've got some pretty big news. Can't wait to share it with you guys.